As you may know, I've done a couple of videos on oxytocin and this general topic before. I talked about how it was filling me out so much and how I had gained several pounds and fullness just over a few days. Well, shortly after I made those videos, life kind of started to get in the way. There were some car issues, a little bit of a flu bug, that sort of thing. And I put the whole experiment on hold. I went back to it starting February 9th. On that day, February 9th, I weighed 214 pounds. As of February 29th, so exactly 20 days later, not even quite three weeks, I had gained exactly 20 pounds. I weighed in at the same gym scale, same outfit, 234.4 pounds. Now, I don't know if this translates on video. I don't know what you can see and what you can't see. All I can say is my measurements are better than they've ever been. And I don't say that lightly. All through my 20s, I used steroids, I wouldn't say willy-nilly, but I certainly didn't know what I know now. And a typical cycle for me in my 20s might be 1,200 milligrams of test or 1,000 milligrams of test plus maybe a little bit of trend, 150 to 250 milligrams a week, something like that, four to six IU of GH a day. And these are the type of things I was doing in my 20s. And and then some. I was all over the map. I tried everything. On My ecdysterone, that amount of test, 230 milligrams a week, give or take. And then that's what I've been on for over, well, I'd say about a year and a half consistently, at least with the ecdysterone and that test level been pretty consistent. On February 9th, I began to take 0 0.1 milligrams my formulation, which gives a very, very slow release compared to the two to eight minutes that oxytocin would normally be active in your system. Right now I'm weighing 234.4. I still have the top two to four abs in good light. I'll throw up a video or a picture of that. You know, not that I'm lean. I didn't even start this lean. This is in the middle of my bulk. I abandoned my uh, contest prep because of this because this is what was giving such crazy results, I couldn't help it. In these three weeks, my arms have gone from 17.25 cold morning measurement, da 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 da, not super strict, but I measure it the same way every time, I'm insecure, give me a break. Chest has gone from 52 inches to 53, and a lot of that's just my structure. I have a really rangy skeleton, let's say. Thighs have gone from 26 to nearly 27. So thighs and chest both up almost an inch. Arms up, actually it's a little over half an inch, from 17.25 uh, to 17.8. If I was to guess, based on those numbers, I would say that I've gained about 7 pounds of muscle. And I don't mean quote-unquote lean weight. Lean weight, they can count water, you can count this or that. I would say that I've gained 7 pounds of muscle, probably 2 or 3 ish pounds of fat, I don't know, and at least 10 pounds of extra fluid. And the reason I say that is, is I did use GH in the past. I did try various IGF ones and things like that in my twenties. And that always added eight ish pounds GH, and then insulin would add another seven, eight, 10 pounds. You just hold more water. Your carb storage, your carb storage is maxed out. There's extra mineral retention. People get the sausage fingers on GH. I'm not getting that right now, so I'm apparently not quite that bloated. But I guarantee you, I'm holding somewhere around an extra 10 pounds of water. So that's not 20 pounds of muscle, you know. That's, but I will say this: it never is. If you're doing a steroid cycle and you jump on, and in the first four to six weeks, you've put on 20 pounds, which that's pretty damn good, really. Only about six, seven, eight pounds of that's muscle. A lot of it's fluid, a lot of it's mineral retention. And what people don't realize is you hold one extra gram of carbohydrates, you're holding three extra grams of water. A lot of us know that. But also, if there's more mineral retention, like I can, I can go to sleep at night, weigh myself right before bed, and wake up nearly the exact same weight. And that's after getting up to pee, having a little more to drink, you know, just, I'm usually up once in the night to pee at least. So that doesn't usually happen. Usually I'm down three pounds through sweating, through 
whatever, but I hold that water in the system more completely, I guess, now. Why is this happening? What is happening? You know, what would cause a guy to gain... I mean, even on the low side estimate, there's at least five pounds of muscle there, okay? What would cause a guy to gain five pounds of muscle in three weeks? 20 pounds of bulk, like steroid cycle-like weight, other than a steroid cycle. Well, if you go and you watch Vigorous Steve's breakdown on his results from using Incrilex, one of the only real effective IGF-1 forms, that's the kind of gains he was talking about getting from Incrilex. So that sent me down the rabbit hole, and I'm going to take you with me. Number one we have up here, oxytocin affects the release of steroids, insulin-like growth factor 1, prostaglandin F2 alpha, and cyclic nucleotides by human granulosa cells in vitro. Now in vitro means in a petri dish, doesn't mean in real life, this doesn't mean it's a human study. But I've never heard anybody talk about this in the fitness industry. And the fitness industry is completely and utterly, and as I was too, I had no idea, is completely and utterly sleeping on two things. One is oxytocin, because a lot of us have tried it, not me particularly, but a lot of us have tried it and used the water, just plain water, to reconstitute it. It's not going to work. Two, EGF, epidermal growth factor. Now, epidermal growth factor is a very interesting pathway that's completely underexplored, unexplored by the fitness industry, by the PED community, by the bodybuilding community. No one talks about epidermal growth factor. And you know what? There is what's called interplay <laughs> between IGF-1 and EGF receptors, EGF and IGF-1 receptors. And I'll tell you real simply why. This is just my theory. If I'm proven wrong one day, I'll shrug and say, okay. <laughs> but here's my theory. The natural IGF-1 receptor in our body is made to accept a 70 amino acid chain. Okay? IGF-1, natural, bioidentical IGF-1 is a 70 amino acid chain. That's what our receptors are made to accept. IGF-1 LR3 is 83 amino acids long. That's why no one gets any results from it. Yeah, it lasts longer in your system as an insulin. That's because insulin receptors have two heads, each holding 51 amino acids. Uh, human insulin is 51, so it's made so it'll accept 102 amino acids across the surface of its two receptors. So that's why LR3 just does insulin activity, right? For the most part. The other thing, too, is oxytocin actually promotes uh, potentiation. That means it's more of an agonist to epidermal growth factor. So if there's epidermal growth factor in your body, there might be some more released from uh, taking oxytocin, but it also activates it. It actually potentiates it. It helps it. it it's, a, it's a friend to it, right? And if you want to go down the rabbit hole a little bit, just go to Google Scholar and type in epidermal growth factor, IGF-1, something of that sort. I've got that here. Look at this list of studies. Mechanisms of activation and signaling. Insulin-like growth factor induces epidermal growth factor receptor, receptor transactivation and cell proliferation through reactive oxygen species. See where we're going with this? There are more growth factors than insulin-like growth factor, okay? and they have anabolic activity, just like insulin growth factor, and some of them will fit into the insulin-like growth factor receptor, thereby activating that receptor, which is what we want. See, SARMs are selective androgen receptor modulators. Think of EGF as a selective IGF-1 receptor modulator, right? Or as a selective growth re you know, factor receptor modulator. But basically what I think is happening is the oxytocin is, in general, the oxytocin is releasing various, it actually increases the production of IGF-1. It actually uh, helps the activity of EGF, epidermal growth factor. And I think it's kind of like the growth hormone 
of the neuropeptide side. Not that growth hormone doesn't have some neuro effects, but you know what I'm saying. So I think there's a lot of activation of various growth factors happening from this kind of like almost parent hormone, which is driving this and helping the various growth factors. All I can say from personal experience is that the gains have been absolutely steroid cycle-like, if not better. And if I say if not better because even when I was using a full-blown cycle back in my 20s and doing amateur bodybuilding competitions, I, do, I don't have great arms. They've never measured more than 17 and a half legitimately, right? So now I'm sitting at really just a hair under 18, 17.8. And this is, like I said, I don't have great arms. So that's, that's the biggest my arms have ever been. And a while back, I talked about like a electrolyte temporary sight enhancement injection. I haven't done that in, since before I started this experiment. I was playing around with that. It didn't add volume, like a synthol or something. It was a shape, you know, inflammation thing. So it's not, that's not the culprit here. And obviously, if my chest is up a full inch, my chest has never been above 52 inches cold. It's 53 inches right now. My legs have never been above a legit 26 at the mid-thigh. Mid They're 27 now. So, yes, this is a bulked-up state. Yes, a lot of this is water. Yes, a lot of this is, uh, you know, mineral retention and stuff. But so, so is it with growth hormone, trust me. You think Chase Irons <clears throat> was doing 18 IU of growth a day and some of that wasn't mineral retention in water? He went from 240 to 280. So, yeah, of course some of it's mineral retention. Of course some of it's water. But a significant portion of it's muscle. And if we know what IGF-1 does, what EGF does, and what growth hormone does, we know that some of that could be hyperplasia, could be new muscle tissue. There's just study after study. I was going to get into some of these. Um, I will link them in the description and you can go through. I will give suggestions for what to search for, but it is just incredible the rabbit hole you can go. So once again, I just wanted to update everybody. That's what's going on with this oxytocin experiment. I'm going to go ahead and carry it out for another few weeks. Uh, my at, Oh, and that's the other thing too is I have high blood pressure, I have a high heart rate, and all this kind of thing. I've had it since birth. My blood pressure has always been on the high side. My heart rate has always been fast, even when I was an infant. So, with that said, I noticed that I feel more relaxed, more focused. That's supposed to be one of the side effects of oxytocin. Well, I can feel it. I can feel that, you know, my drive's a little better, my focus is a little better. But also, my heart rate is good, you know, for the first time in a long time. And I'm the heaviest I've been in <laughs> a damn long time. And my heart rate's actually lower. My blood pressure is within normal range. It's always right at the top of that. You know, it's just not, it's not perfect. So for me, this is actually bringing me some of the health benefits that I would like. I don't think it's wise to run it forever. I don't think you should ever push a growth factor or growth inducing hormone for long long term you know there's there are risks that could become involved with egf with igf1 they're both growth factors and if you have cancer they could be very cancer promoting because they're growth promoting and they insulin and insulin like growth factor and all these kind of things do grow cancers just like they grow other cells so that's something to consider too the caveat to that is that Oxytocin itself has some anti-inflammatory, anti anti-cancerous effects itself. So with oxytocin, it's just like, in a way, it's similar to using growth hormone in that you're not going to go run wild. You can't just take a shot of growth hormone and have IGF-1 through the, through the ceiling. You would have to push and push and push and then probably take IGF-1 on top of that. So this is the safer route. I have injected EGF. But that's a story for another video and an experiment for another time. I'm going to go ahead and run this for a, I'm not going to go over six weeks. I'm going to see how it goes. We'll see if the weight keeps going up. I'm heading to the gym again tonight. We will see if I'm a little heavier. And so far, so good. I 
<laughs> that's the understatement of the year. So again, like I said, I don't know if it translates onto video here, but this, I am 20 pounds heavier and it is not fat. Yep, I got a little pinch I can pinch down here, but it's just, I'm not so puffy that there's no definition or my face is super bloated or anything like that. I'm 234 and a half pounds, so it's not like I'm shredded. I'm not a huge guy, but that's my results so far. I think it's pretty exciting, pretty interesting. Thought I'd share it.